Welcome. That's, that means find your way to a cozy seat. And welcome to everyone who's online. Thank you for joining us. The Graduate School of Social Work at the University of Denver for our Catalyst for Social Justice series. I'm Amanda Moore McBride. I'm honored to be dean of this school. We started this series in 2017 at a time when I think many people saw what was ahead of us and what indeed we are living into, which is a period of amplified hate and marginalization of the marginalized. And we wanted to have a space for our campus community and the Denver community, and now through technology in communities across the United States to come together to hear about hope and to utilize art and storytelling as a way to expose us to the issues that those who live next to us and work with us and are pumping gas on the other side and buy their groceries where we do, the issues that they're living with in their lives that maybe we don't understand, or maybe we do. And then how we live through that, how in this human project we come together to address prejudice and discrimination so that all humans can realize their potential. Through this series, we've addressed white fragility. We've looked at immigration through the eyes of a one-man play. And tonight, we're delighted to bring the marriage of photography and storytelling with social science. The representations of older transgender and gender non-conforming people just don't exist. They are not part of mainstream society, but we have two incredible leaders here tonight that would like to change that. Over five years, photographer Jess Dugan and social work scholar Vanessa Fabre have traveled throughout the United States collecting stories, looking at the intersections across gender identity, age, race, ethnicity, sexuality, socioeconomic status, and geographic location from the most rural locations to the most urban. They traveled from coast to coast, including a few stories collected right here in Denver. So tonight, we're gonna hear about what it means to survive on this shore, to learn about their exhibition. And for those of you that are online, uh, beforehand, many people walked the room and got to see the pictures and read the stories. We will still have that opportunity for those of you in the room. The bar is gonna stay open. You get to do that while, while the program's going on, but then also through a reception. And I'm delighted for the leadership of Professor uh, Stephanie George and our comms team who are also gonna pull our online crowd into a separate room and reception where you gotta bring your own beer. But uh, <laughs> we're delighted to facilitate conversation and reflection after the event. I have to tell you, I ha I've had several moments in this room. Uh, I walk in every morning and the room's unlocked and I'll, I may have time to read one story or two or three. And I've had a soundtrack playing in my mind every time that I've been in here. Cole Porter was a queer composer and musician who wrote a song in the late 1930s called Don't Fence Me In. And that's what I think of every time I read these stories. Don't fence me in. Don't assign me at birth and then hold me to it. There's a self inside of me that wants to be realized. I'm delighted that we have Jess Dugan and Vanessa Fabre tonight to talk through the photography, to talk through the stories. Jess Dugan is an artist who explores all of these issues in lots of different ways. And uh, the pedigree includes Harvard trained. I think what's so incredible is that her portraiture is in the Smithsonian. It's in museums and communities likely represented in our online uh, uh, crowd tonight. But she views the world through social justice. And so that art is not just to stand on its own, but it's I think of it as social practice in the arts. It's how do we expand consciousness and action for society. Vanessa Fabre is a professor at the George Warren Brown School of Social Work at Washington University in Denver. 
She's also an affiliate faculty in the Women, Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and a faculty scholar at the Institute for Public Health. I love this intersection of gerontology, utilizing and honoring multiple ways of knowing in the world, and then framing this as a health issue. She received her PhD from the University of Chicago and is herself a licensed clinical social worker, so she's bringing that practice to life now through data. I have to say, I was there at the beginning. I remember Vanessa's job talk. We used to be faculty colleagues at Washington University. So when I saw that they were taking this show on the road, we said, you gotta come to Denver. We wanna hear your story and we want your inspiration. We've structured tonight a little differently. So Jess will talk about the art aspect of this. And then Vanessa will pick up and talk about the storytelling and also some current projects uh, that they're working on and where they might take this. They're also really open to Q&A. So after they've both talked, then we'll open it up to the audience. And that includes our online group as well. And then afterwards, we'll continue our reception. So don't fence us in. Please welcome Jess Dugan. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'm a little short, so give me just one second here. There we go. All right. Can you guys hear me? That may be too short. Hang on. Okay, how's that? Perfect. All right, and now I have to do something with a PC. Hang on. Okay, I did it. Excellent. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, before I begin, Vanessa and I want to thank Amanda Moore McBride for the invitation and bringing us here and all of your support of this project and bringing the exhibition. We're really grateful for that. And we also want to give an extra special thank you to Trish Becker, who's been amazing to work with and has done everything for us to make this happen. Um, and also to Helen Pierce, who worked with us on the design side and the media side. So we're really grateful for all of your help. And I know the way these, these things happen, there are probably uh, large amounts of other people involved who I, I don't know to name personally, but we're very grateful to you too. So, um, as uh, Dean Moore McBride mentioned, I'm going to speak a bit about the art side of the project, how we created it, and a bit of what we are doing with it in the world now that it's finished. And then Vanessa will come up and talk more specifically about her research and some next steps for the work. Um, but before I get into the project, we've had a special request for a story about how Vanessa and I met, which was uh, country line dancing at a gay country bar in Chicago called Charlie's. <laughs> And uh, I know we have a Charlie's here. Um, and so I was a, uh, finishing my MFA at Columbia College Chicago. Vanessa was finishing her PhD at University of Chicago. And for any of you who dance or any kind of organized um, thing like that, you know, we would often dance with people and have no idea what they did for a living or where they lived or where they worked. You know, it's just like you see these people over and over. So we met and we're also life partners, which isn't always clear in the project. Um, and so it's not a secret. We just didn't foreground it. Um, <laughs> and so anyway, we met dancing and then suddenly she, you know, was like, what do you do? What do you do? And we had all these interests in common. And so pretty early in our relationship, we we're just talking about ideas. I, I, as a photographer, have worked within LGBTQ communities and specifically trans communities for a long time, and Vanessa also had prior to this project for her own research. And so one day we were talking, and I said, we should do a project together. And we sort of were like, yeah, maybe. And then you know, a little bit of time passed, and I said, no, we, we should really do this project together because we could make something that doesn't exist. And so that's how this project came to be. Um, the original impetus was us meeting and combining our interests. And Vanessa takes a lot of credit, proudly, for getting me into the aging world. And I take credit for getting her into photography and visual art. So we each have our little moment of pride. Um, all right, so that's the, that's the personal impetus story. So, so Survive on the Shore is a collaborative interdisciplinary project. It's made up of portraits and interviews. We worked on it between 2013 and 2018. We photographed and interviewed 88 people throughout the United States. And our age range was from 50 all the way to 90. And I'll talk about all of this in more depth as I go through the work. 
Um, the only requirement was that the individuals we photographed and interviewed self-identified as transgender or gender nonconforming, and we were very open in terms of how people um, interpreted that for themselves, and I'll also talk about that a bit more. So for each person that we met with, we would go to their home or personal space. Sometimes we met at an LGBT center. Um, I met someone in the National Forest in New Mexico because he was an avid hiker. So we really went to wherever people were comfortable. But it was important to us that we travel to them as opposed to you know, setting up a station at a conference. It, that personal aspect was really significant. So we would travel to them and we would first conduct an autobiographical interview that was usually about an hour about their identity, their life experiences. And so um, I'm gonna begin and end my part of the talk by reading you a quote, but I'm not gonna read you every one because we'd be here for a long, long time. And you can also see some others on the wall. So I'm gonna start by reading you Chris's quote. So Chris says, I feel like I was always punished for my masculinity when I was female designated by both straight people and lesbians. I was not the kind of woman that either women or men wanted to be around. I was way too scary and people didn't know what to do with me. I was always a fish out of water in terms of my gender presentation. So in a huge way, my transition has been like Nirvana for it to get all aligned with me and then have the world treat me well while I'm aligned has been amazing. I mean, just really amazing for me. So I lived in that lesbian world, even as it was difficult to do. I actually gave birth to both of our children, which was never inconsistent with my sense of still being a man and being pregnant. And I know that many people can't understand that, or they might have some understanding, but it was not inconsistent for me to be with my male identity and want to have children. Integrating all of our identities as a family has been a journey. So my spouse and former spouse identify as lesbians. My kids identified as part of a lesbian family. So applying to colleges, how do you explain on the FAFSA forms for the federal government <laughs> that somebody is a biological mother and at the same time they're legally a man and what's their legal relationship and how do you explain that I'm legally a man that was never married to my former spouse who is legally their mother because we were a lesbian couple? So there's layer upon layer upon layer of complication when interfacing in the world, even as it was not very much of a blip in terms of my family's experience of me and didn't change a whole lot the way our family life ran, was not really that big of a deal. And yet this interface out in the world became a pretty big deal. So again, that will give you a sense of the kind of texts that go with each piece, um, which you can also of course see here in the exhibition. So from the beginning of the project, we were very committed to seeking out a diverse group of subjects. So we saw diversity in terms of race and ethnicity, gender identity and expression. We included people who identified as female to male and male to female, as well as people who identified as non-binary or genderqueer or fluid or whatever term that they used for themselves. Um, Justin Vivian actually has this amazing <clears throat> moment in her quote where she talks about thinking about growing older, and part of the reason she decided to begin medically transitioning was to have a physical record of her transness. And there's this very funny line at the end where she said, you know, I was afraid I would, I, I would lose my agency and end up in a room full of old men, and I never ever want to be an old man. Like, that is just not my jam. So anyway, hers is particularly funny, but, um, but we did very intentionally seek out people on all aspects of the gender identity and expression spectrum as well. We also sought diversity in terms of age. Uh, our minimum age was 50, our oldest participant was 90. We sought diversity in terms of socioeconomic status, geographic location. We went all throughout the United States. We went to big cities, small towns, the South, the Midwest. Um, you know, we didn't sort of hit every state systematically, but we went to every major region and tried to get as many different stories as we could. This is Gloria, she's one of my favorites. This was made in Chicago and um, she actually ran a charm school at the LGBT center there called the Center on Halstead where she mentored young trans women, uh, particularly trans women of color on how to be a lady. So she had very strong opinions and I'm sure I would have failed as all of her classes. Um, and then, you know, we, we keep in touch with everyone. So I, I spoke to her a couple years later and asked her what she was doing. And I learned that at 72 at that time, she decided to take up comedy. So she was taking classes as a stand-up comic and wanted to, to launch a new career. So um, anyway, so she's, everyone's amazing, but Gloria is one of my favorites. So for most of the people in the project, we didn't know them prior to this project. I met them because they were interested in being part of it. And I'll talk a little bit later about how we found people 
Um, but a few, there were a few exceptions, and Hank and Sam were two of those exceptions. So I actually grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, and my mom went to a lesbian Bible study group that Sam taught. And so my 10-year-old self went to this lesbian Bible study group, and I primarily remember that they had really good snacks, and they had some cute dogs. Um, but when I was working on this project, I was talking to my mom about it, and she said, you know, you should, you should go interview Hank and Sam. And so I called them, and I said, I'm working on this project. I don't know how you identify. Do you want to be part of it? And they did. And so Vanessa and I drove down um, and spent the day with them at their home. And it was really amazing for me for a number of reasons. One was that I feel that Hank and I have a very similar internal identity. I identify as non-binary. Um, but my, my experience in the world is so different from Hank's experience in the world because of our generational difference, so that really struck me. Um, and also, at the end of this photo, uh, at the end of our day together, Hank and Sam had shared that they had each had breast cancer later in life, and they had each had double mastectomies, which they were very excited about. And so, at the end of our time together, we all ended up like taking our shirts off and comparing our scars, and it was this really sweet moment. And you know, I say that not, not just to share the particulars, but because the, the making of this work really created a kind of um, intimacy and closeness in a very short amount of time with the people that we met with. Most of them were strangers when we showed up, and then we left just feeling like they had shared their most you know, difficult life stories, their most joyful life stories. Um, people were incredibly generous in sharing their stories with us and welcoming us into their homes and lives. And I was also really struck by how significantly people wanted to give back. Many of the people we met with wanted to tell their stories to help someone else, to prevent someone else from going through some of the struggle they went through. So um, it was incredibly moving and humbling working on this project. So there are a few still life images in the series. These are Hank's hats. Um, the third one in says, dysfunctional veteran, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> this is Sky in Palm Springs. And then this is Sky and his partner, Mike. Um, most trans men I know are very jealous of their beards. <laughs> So we always conducted the interview prior to making the portrait, and that did a number of things. One is it let the people we were meeting with get comfortable with us, it let us get to know them, but also sometimes people spoke about specific stories or experiences that we can incorporate into the photograph. So in DeSanti's case, um, he struggled with substance abuse for the first 50 years of his life, um, or from the time he was an adult until he was 50, and spoke about how during that time, music was the only thing that kind of kept him grounded and how important it was to his transition when he eventually got sober and transitioned, and um, now he's a professional musician. But music was his stabilizer throughout this period, and so we decided to include one of his guitars in the photograph. This is Alexis in Chicago. She's a very well-known activist. This is Lewis in Springfield, <laughs> Western Massachusetts. This is Jude in Yuba City, California. And Jude was 75 when we photographed him. Um, and it's interesting because of the age range of the people that we interviewed <laughs> and also their life narratives being so diverse. Some of the people in the project transitioned as early as 1971, like Jude. Other people transitioned in 2016 or very shortly before we met them. And so it was interesting because Jude was actually the person that many other people referenced as being the first trans man they had ever seen and the first role model. So he's had a very long um, period of time of being an outspoken activist and a role model for other people. This is him at the age of 32. This is Aiden in Washington State. He's the founder of a conference called Gender Odyssey, which I imagine some of you know. This is Duchess in Los Angeles. This is one of my favorite photographs, just because she's so fabulous. <laughs> this is Bobby in Detroit. Um, similar to DeSanti's story, Bobby had a long career in the military, and her home was full of planes and flags, and so we felt like that was important to kind of bring into her photograph and, and into her story. This is Suki in New York. This is David in Massachusetts. So one of the things we really tried to do 
in the project is to balance the complexity of people's lives. So we didn't want to only portray joy and we didn't want to only portray struggle. So we thought about that in terms of each particular narrative, but also in terms of the project as a whole. Um, David had an interesting story in that he also transitioned in, in the 1970s, but didn't come out publicly until 2009. So his children didn't know, his congregation didn't know, and he lost his congregation, decided to go back and pursue a PhD, and eventually found a new congregation um, in Massachusetts. But he had a, a fairly difficult coming out story. And so you'll see if you read more of the interviews and look through the book, some of the stories are very difficult and some are very joyful, and some of them have both of those things in the same story. And so we really tried to honor people's truths rather than kind of setting out to portray one side over the other. This is Caprice in Chicago. Um, I'm fairly certain she had this whole photo set up in her mind. <laughs> I showed up. Uh, it was pretty easy <laughs> tonight. Um, but she also had an amazing story. She worked for a social service agency that was um, trying to get trans women, particularly low-income trans women, to enroll in health insurance. And so her agency held office hours from 9 to 5 and wondered why no one came. And so she started throwing what she called waiting to exhale parties at 6 a.m. They started at a Burger King, and then they grew so big they moved to her home. But she would have people who'd been working overnight come, um, and in exchange for a voucher and a meal, they would uh, enroll in health insurance, and she would help them. So I thought her model was really amazing and a really powerful story. This is Debbie and Danny in St. Joseph, Missouri. It's a small town north of Kansas City. And Danny's story is one of the difficult ones. He um, he had a stroke and went to the hospital and was essentially ignored for 24 hours because of transphobia, where during that period of time he had a second stroke that caused him um, much more significant damage. So we met him a few months after that and he was still relearning to walk and very much still recovering from that. And it's interesting for me because I, you know, I live in the Midwest now, but I travel and present this in New York and Los Angeles and Chicago. And, Sometimes people in, in bigger urban areas are surprised that this happens. And Vanessa will talk about how you can't make assumptions about urban versus rural. But um, I have found in certain places, people are just sort of stunned that this happens. So we feel that it's important to include these stories as well. This is Tony in San Diego. And this is Grace, who lives in Boston. She, um, some of you may know her if you're involved in, in more national activism, but she's been an LGBTQ activist for 40 some odd years now. She's the executive director of the Boston Alliance of, of Gay, Lesbian, Youth. And I knew her when I was a teenage LGBT activist in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I've known her for a very long time. Um, so I'm gonna read you Grace's quote, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the project is, is existing in the world. So Grace says, I always felt more like girls, like women. Even when I was watching movies or television shows or reading books, the female characters were the ones that I identified with just sort of instinctively. So I knew I was born male, but I certainly was a feminine boy growing up, a genderqueer boy. I was harassed and bullied and got a lot of negative attention because of that. I was assumed to be gay from the earliest get-go as well, even though it wasn't talked about then in the 60s. So I was called all the names associated with that. Sissy, faggot, fairy, all of that. I didn't feel like I was transsexual. I didn't have that profound sense of body dysphoria that lots of transsexuals report, even though there were things that I wanted to change. So the way I understood that and was able to express that in the 80s was maybe what we would now call genderqueer. That term wasn't used then, but I lived in another gender space. I just was living in this third gender space. I didn't see it as on my way to anything. I've been lucky to have people in my life who have been supportive of me in my journey, wherever that would lead me. So it was less about giving me guidance on a specific path and more about people who have said, your identity is evolving and that's a wonderful thing and we encourage you to explore that and go with that. <laughs> I still see myself as on a journey. When I received an award a few years ago at a conference, I said, in the 60s they called me a sissy, in the 70s they called me a faggot, in the 80s, I was a queen. In the 90s, I was transgender. In the 2000s, I was a woman, and now I'm just Grace. So her quote is also one of my favorites, perhaps for obvious reasons, but I love that she talks not only about her own individual journey, but also talks about this journey within a larger, changing social and political landscape. 
So I mentioned we started making this project in 2013. For the first couple of years, we started with people we knew. They told people they knew. It grew very organically. And then around 2015, I think we had made about 25 or 30 portraits and interviews. We created a website, um, started getting the word out about the project, and then we collaborated with this writer, uh, Jacob Bernstein, who wrote a piece for the New York Times, a larger piece about transgender older adults. And this press really exploded the project for us. Um, it put the project on a national scale. After this ran, I got hundreds of emails from people wanting to participate or bring us to their town or you know, support the project in some way. So this was a really pivotal moment for us in terms of finding people. Um, the other ways we found people was by going to several different transgender conferences, including the Trans Wellness Conference in Philadelphia, Gender Odyssey in Seattle. Um, I think it moved, but I went in Seattle. And, um, <laughs> Also, just through community. So there were certain people in the community that we knew were important activists. And so we worked to, to meet and include those people. Um, and then I also travel separately as, as an artist. And whenever I would travel, I would connect with local nonprofit organizations, and they would also connect us with people. So it was a multi-pronged approach to finding um, folks. And certainly with diversity in mind, the New York Times readership is a certain demographic. So this led to a certain um, group of people, but we were very intentional about uh, having other methods as well. This is one of the first exhibitions of the work. This is at the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago. And while we had this up, uh, we organized, in collaboration with the museum, a separate satellite show. This is at the LGBT Center at the Center on Halstead. And so if you know Chicago, you know they're in very different parts of town, very different um, groups of people go to see them. And so for me, it's really important that this work exists in a museum space because I think that's critical and I believe very deeply in the power of representation. And so that's important to me, but I also really want it to exist in community spaces and, and exist outside of the you know, capital A art world. So this duality was really perfect and it's something we've continued as much as, as possible. So in 2018, we made a book. The book has 65 portraits and interviews. And it was really important to me that everyone in the project get a book. I'm sure you know um, either from before or from this evening that photography books are expensive and uh, would have been out of reach for many of the people in the work. And so we um, sent everyone a book. And as we sent them the book, we would get these pictures back of them holding the book or them flipped to their page. Um, and I've since learned at various events that people often know what page number they're on, which is pretty charming. Um, so that was great. So as we have promoted the work, um, we have felt that it's really important to foreground the stories of the subjects. We feel that the work is not really about us and our stories. It's more a vehicle to tell other people's stories. And so we've carried that through the various press events and, and, and um, talks whenever we can. So this was a book release at Women and Children First in Chicago. And instead of us giving a formal talk, we invited participants to come and share their stories. This is an art fair in Chicago called Expo Chicago. And I invited Gloria to come be present while her work was up uh, or her photo was up and while we had a book signing. And not a single person wanted me to sign the book. <laughs> They all wanted Gloria to sign the book, as you can see. It was pretty sweet. So around the time of the book coming out, we had a pretty significant press run. It started with this piece in the New York Times and really kind of went from there into 25 or 30 press outlets. And so this was amazing in a lot of ways and really exciting. It got the work to a much larger audience, but it also put the work on such a mainstream scale that it invited some difficult feedback as well. So that's something that we've thought about how to manage. And um, this is a Instagram takeover I did for the New Yorker photo account. And I don't know if you can see on the screen, but like on the picture of Mike and Sky, there's 15,000 likes, which is just the scale that my work is not usually on. And so this was a really interesting experience because it got a lot of positive comments and a lot of exposure, but there were some negative comments, and some of the negative comments were really awful. And so I was thinking, how do we manage this? You know, I, as the maker, feel so responsible about where the work is shown, how it's shown, how the people are presented. But there is a certain element of putting something out in the world that you can't control. And so this was a difficult moment for us thinking about how to handle it. And I reached out to several of the subjects and 
they basically said, like, we've heard it before, don't worry about it. Um, but it was, you know, a, a difficult moment to, to kind of grapple with. So this work exists as a museum exhibition. This is actually a gallery in St. Louis where it opened. And again, we always want to involve the subjects in the work as much as we can. So on our big grand opening, we had several people present. This is Steph, who lives in St. Louis, so she was local. This is John, who actually lives in a very small town in Arkansas, and he's very active in trans communities online, but prior to this opening had never met another trans person in person because where he lives is so um, isolated. And so he came up and actually spent the whole weekend with us and doing these events, and so that was really meaningful. We view the exhibition space as the beginning of something rather than the end. And so while the exhibition was up, we had as much programming as we possibly could. This is a group of students from the Brown School. Um, we also had family groups with gender diverse children come in. We had um, various community groups have events in the space. We organized a storytelling night for the local um, transgender and gender nonconforming community in collaboration with two local nonprofits. So we really try to, to make a shell that then can be used as, as much as possible. The museum exhibition is traveling. So this past year, it's been at three museums in Florida, in Massachusetts, and in New Mexico, and we're continuing that traveling. In addition to the museum exhibition, we created a limited edition portfolio that's really designed for <laughs> art museums that are in teaching context, so teaching museums. Um, and this portfolio has 12 quotes and photographs, and it's meant to be used to teach students across all disciplines, not just in art museums or art departments, but for social work classes and women and gender studies classes. So we made 12 of these, and they're all placed throughout the United States. There's actually one at um, Colorado State, which is the closest to here, I think. Um, this is an installation view of that portfolio at the Tang Teaching Museum at Skidmore. And then this is the community exhibition, which we luckily have here, so you can see it in real time. But, you know, museum exhibitions are expensive and specific, you know, environmental requirements and things. So um, we really wanted to make the work available outside of that art museum context as well. So we created this community exhibition, and it's available to anyone who wants to host it. It's really meant for venues that are not art venues. Um, and this was at a synagogue in St. Louis. This is the same show at the Brown School at Washington University. And then the last thing I'm gonna talk about before turning it over to Vanessa is um, using the project for activism and advocacy and also archiving the work. So we created this massive amount of interview data and a lot of it got edited down for the final quote. So we're donating the full transcripts to several LGBT archives to be used for research. Um, which you'll hear about in just a sec. And then we also are collaborating with basically any nonprofit who wants to collaborate with us to use it for education and advocacy. So we've had groups use it for trainings. Um, this was a collaboration with Open House in the Bay Area, an organization working with LGBTQ seniors. And it was protesting the removal of a question relating to sexual orientation and gender and the National Survey of Older Americans Act participants. So they went looking for images of older trans people and couldn't find any and asked if they could use ours and created this poster and actually mailed it to policymakers. So basically, we're in phase two of the project where the making is done and now we're really excited to get it out in the world and use it in as many ways as possible. So I'm gonna pause my part there and um, Vanessa's gonna come talk to you more about her research. Good evening, everyone. We're really happy to be here. So I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about um, these interviews. So what you're seeing, um, let me give you an outline here. What you're seeing are um, just a quote from these biographical interviews that we did with people. And so I'm gonna tell you about some of the research analysis and maybe helping profession or social work implications that I'm starting to draw on from these interviews. Um, and you stole my thunder because I'm gonna I'm gonna do Justin Vivian's quote later. So you have to laugh like it's the first time you've heard Justin <laughs> Vivian's quote. <laughs> um, all right, so the first thing I wanna do, for the researchers in the room, we can geek out a little bit um, in terms of social science and how we try to assess and measure some of the things that we're talking about tonight. In general, what we know about trans and gender nonconforming older adults um, is not great in terms of some health outcomes. Um, 
for trans and gender nonconforming older adults, when they're compared with cisgender, lesbian, gay, and bisexual older adults, they experience twice the rates of poor physical health, disability, depressive symptomatology, and perceived stress. Um, those outcomes are actually fairly easy to predict. I'm deciding where I'm looking here. Um, <laughs> Got to balance my height and the screen and my 40 plus year old vision. Um, okay, I'm gonna look down and up here. Um, so those outcomes are actually pretty easy to predict. Um, and this is not going to come to, as a surprise to many people. Those things are predicted by perceived lack of access to services, internalized stigma, which I'll talk about more in a minute, experiences of victimization, and lack of social supports. Um, and this knowledge is coming from the first wave of a study that my colleague Karen Fredrickson Goldson is doing at University of Washington. Um, this is some of the first work funded by the National Institutes of Health that's focusing on aging and older adults and multiple generations of people um, over time. Um, so this study has also found, um, in statistical terms, a strong mediating effect. Um, when we try to figure out, we try if we know someone's gender identity, we want to predict or understand their health outcomes, um, what we found is you really have to understand an interaction, what happens in someone's life. It really isn't um, just gender identity alone. And so for most people, it's their experiences in the world, and it's whether they experience victimization and whether they internalize stigmatizing experiences that seems to, at least from our perspective, tell us the most about what is going to happen or what might happen in terms of their health outcomes. Um, and in non-statistical language, um, my shorthand for this is that it's not being trans that's the problem. It's being trans in a transphobic society that is the problem. So you can say this in statistics language and you can say it in regular old language um, to help people understand that it's the social world that creates a lot of these problems. Um, and several other surveys of trans older adults um, by some really good organizations that I'm gonna tell you about in a minute um, have also found that these experiences of victimization and stigmatization are central to people's lives. So for me as a researcher, I want to understand, so if these things are so important, how do we prevent them? How do we interrupt them? How do we prevent them? How do we help people heal? How do we change things for the next generation? Um, but I think that requires kind of getting into the black box, so to speak, of how of the nature of these things and what's actually happening. Um, so, um, I found a beautiful conceptual article. I'm a total concept theory nerd. I found this beautiful article um, that looked at a lot of different research findings about trans people and proposed a way of starting to make sense of um, especially experiences of stigmatization. So these authors um, argue that we have to be thinking in a multi-level way about stigma. And they argue that we should be thinking, one, at what they call the individual level, um, our thoughts, emotions, some of our most um, innermost senses of ourselves, how we might internalize um, and experience stigma within ourselves. But then we also have to think about social relationships and what they call interpersonal stigma. And specifically, they argue it's important to understand people's experiences with people known to them. So this is often early caregivers, people in your family, in your communities, people that you work with. Um, but then we have to push ourselves to even think at a broader level. And so these authors argue that we should also be thinking in terms of what they call structural stigma. So this is, these are the laws and the policies, which um, I'll talk about in a minute. The participants in, the, in this project are very conscious and well aware of. Um, but our, those are harder things to target sometimes, and sometimes they're harder things to study. So um, I came upon this article and started thinking about multi-level stigma. Um, and then I saw that no one had tried to apply this construct to older adults who who've been experiencing some of these social um, circumstances for a very long period of time. So I was curious, um, what does this look like for older adults who've navigated stigmatizing experiences as young people, adolescents, midlife, and, and, and older adults? Um, so now I'm gonna present a table with some um, more details about the participants in the project um, and just tell you briefly, I'm happy to talk about research methods all day long um, with anyone who wants to ask more questions, but just briefly, um, here is an overview. It's a little hard to see on the screen. Um, we ended up interviewing about um, half of the participants identified on the trans feminine side of things, half on the trans masculine sides of things. These, this language changes yearly or by the day 
days sometimes, um, and several people who identified as non-binary um, or gender diverse. Um, most of the participants were between 50 and 70, um, but like Jess said, we interviewed someone as old as 90, um, and really, these um, stories don't exist in any other data set. Um, very few people are interviewing people um, in depth about their life experiences who come from those older generations. Um, in terms of race and ethnicity, in general, um, about 40% of the participants in the project identified as people of color, about 60% European American or white. Um, and as Jess said, we did travel around the country and really wanted, we didn't get to every state, but we wanted to represent at least every major geographic region. Um, so for my research on these interviews, um, it's funny to call something a secondary data analysis on your own data, um, but this is a kind of somewhat retrospective look at the body of the data after we'd collected it. Um, so what I'm gonna tell you about tonight is um, uh, a, an interpretive content analysis, which basically means that um, we looked at the interviews first with the lens of multi-level stigma and tried to pull out what we thought made sense of how that manifested. And then we set that down and just read and looked at the interviews again to try to pull up things that didn't seem to fit. And then at the end, we kind of pieced those things together to try to draw some common themes. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about a few of those themes. Um, so I found, not surprisingly, that stigmatization is really central um, to people's experiences, um, but it's not deterministic in its impact. Um, a lot of these stories complicated what we might want to think in terms of how stigma works. Um, we found individual stigma really affects us, someone's sense of identity and perhaps even more importantly, their sense of self-efficacy, what they think is possible for themselves and how they can make decisions that drive their own life course trajectory. Um, I found that interpersonal stigma is really manifested in this unrelenting unpredictability, never knowing when you could be rejected or stigmatized or treated well and embraced. And, and people have used the term hypervigilance to capture that, um, but that unpredictability, and then in addition, conflicted relationships, which I'll talk about in a minute, where um, you experience some acceptance, but some not good stuff, and how do you negotiate that? That, um, I think, is a complexity that doesn't always rise to the surface when we talk about stigma. Um, and in terms of structural stigma, this was pervasive in terms of how people talked about living in certain states or living in the United States and culture in the United States. Um, but many people really consciously, actively chose to respond to structural stigma by engaging in activism and getting involved in community groups. And that became a really important part of development for people in later life. So there's a bit of a good story there that people aren't passive recipients of, of structural stigma, that they push back and collectively organize to make things better for themselves and for, for the next generation. So I'll share a couple additional quotes. Um, and now that because I'm in research mode, um, I've actually assigned our participants to Pseudonyms, so you might recognize um, a few people. It's kind of this is an unusual research circumstance. Usually, you wouldn't have assign a pseudonym to someone, um, but I do this because I'm starting to venture in more into my interpretations of people's stories. Um, so I think it's fair to put this in that research mode and start to acknowledge that I'm telling you what I think of people's stories. So an example of individual level stigma was provided by um, whom I call Olivia. She's a white trans woman, 69, living out in Western United States, and she's a rock climber. And she said, and so it actually made me feel pretty bad about myself and my life. Like, what's wrong with me that I want this? And I never really told anybody. It was just my deep, dark secret. And I was always terribly afraid of getting caught. Like, if I got caught, then my life would just end somehow, that nobody would talk to me or climb with me or love me. And I think this is a good example of individual level stigma because we don't know what will happen in the world and in a way that doesn't matter. It's how these expectations are internalized and how those thoughts recur in someone's mind that influences their sense of self and the decisions they make. Um, and I also think it's important to recognize that internalization is real. It is not made up. It's based on real world experiences or oftentimes the experiences of other people. So, I think that captures that internalization process pretty well. 
Another example um, is from Benjamin. He's a white trans man, 52, living in the Northeast, and he, I think, describes this internal struggle in relation to the external world. So he said, I was still not out yet, even though my sense of myself was that I've always known that I've been a trans man. And it's kind of weird about a thing like survival that as young as I was, some part of me knew that that was better, that there was just no way the world was going to be okay with who I was, who I knew I was to be, and that it was a better choice to be presenting as a lesbian. So here again, you see how someone is very acutely aware of their so social circumstances, and that kind of infiltrates what they think is possible for themselves and influences how they make decisions about their lives in a very internalized way. So a couple examples of what I think are um, manifestations of interpersonal stigma. Um, this is from Miles. He's a black trans man. He's 54, living in the Northeast. Um, and he reflected on um, what he called the love but lack of acceptance from his mother. He shared, my mom is very religious, and I was very, very scared to tell my mommy. So I was really, really quite terrified that she would vanish out of my life and tell me to go away and never come back. And she didn't. She doesn't understand, and I can understand how she doesn't understand, for her gender is immutable. You are what you are, and this was what you are. So she taught me the difference between love and acceptance. She may never accept what she sees as a decision that does not make any sense to her, but she still does love and care for me. And so I think this um, story for Miles helps to capture the nuance of what it's like to navigate a conflicted and somewhat unpredictable relationship. Um, sometimes our stories in the queer world get oversimplified. Either you're thrown out of the house or your parents accept you. Um, but some people say, well, I wasn't thrown out of the house, but I still don't feel accepted and like someone really understands and validates who I am. And that takes a toll over a long period of time. So um, I thank Miles for sharing that story with us and helping us to think through. Someone can love someone and not accept them, and that's a really important experience for a trans person. Another example of interpersonal stigma. This is from Jackie. She's a white trans woman. She's 77 in the Northwest. Um, she actually runs um, a supportive housing for trans youth, and she reflected a little more on the nature of these conflicted relationships that people experience. <laughs> She said, family sometimes works out, sometimes doesn't, which we all know. Justine here was kind of thrown out of the house at a young age, at 12 years old. Had to live on the streets, you know, survived. But then, just recently, she sent her mother books about and information about trans. Her mother read it and then just recently came up here and visited for a week. And now they're back together again. When I transitioned, my parents were already dead, but I've got four brothers. One will not see me, two will, and my sister-in-law is fine with it. Again, I think this captures the unpredictable um, and conflicted ways that people have to navigate their family um, over time. And that's something we have to be sensitive to when we're trying to tap into someone's story and their experiences and to help them navigate those moving forward. So I'll give you a couple examples um, of what I think are um, structural stigma. So this is from Casey. Uh, that Jess alluded to earlier. So Casey um, talked about taking hormones, one, to have a record of her transness, but really because she is aware of the stigma and discrimination she's likely to experience in the aging network, um, specifically nursing homes. Nursing homes are not safe places for a lot of people, but for trans people, they can be very dangerous places. Um, so she said, it wasn't until my late 40s, and part of the reason I did that was so I would have a physical and medical record of being trans, because I'm aware so many older LGBT people, when they become ill or if they start to deteriorate mentally and aren't able to articulate things as well, end up being just in involuntarily, just by the assumptions of the people who care for them being relegated back into the closet. So my fear was that I would become incapacitated in some way and then be stuck in a room full of old men, and I never, ever want to be an old man. Um, so, I mean, Casey, um, I think, exemplifies a keen, conscious awareness of structural constraints, um, but then also fortitude and self-efficacy in deciding how one is going to navigate that. So um, another example of structural stigma um, and how I think it is an important aspect of understanding how people um, engage in activism and changing social change as they age um, was provided by Whitney. She's a black trans woman. She's 56. She lives in the Midwest. Um, and she talks about stigma as a catalyst for activism. Um, and that
almost echoes and resonates with the theme of the, the series here at the school. Um, so she said, at the suggestion of my therapist at the time, I got involved with this youth organization, queer youth organization. Actually served on that board for six years and really met some really cool people. Started really understanding a lot of the issues that were in the queer community. Started understanding a lot of issues that were facing other trans people like myself. Even though I mean I knew people, they knew what was happening, but with a different sort of lens, a more politicized lens. And that's when my activism began, really as an immediate response of self-preservation. For a lot of the people that we interviewed, um, they felt that they had to take matters into their own hands and push back on society's constraints. And a lot of ways, aging offers you um, a bit more latitude um, in terms of pushing back on those constraints. So one more word about structural stigma that Jess alluded to. Um, so we found that everyone experiences, everyone could talk about the ways that culture and laws and policies were making it hard to be a trans person. Um, but interestingly, um, and we, uh, we didn't share this story in Jess's talk, some of the worst cases of abuse and victimization that people shared with us happened in blue states. And they happened in large metropolitan cities. And that gave Jess and I pause, and it's something that I've also been analyzing um, with the students that have been looking through these interviews with me. Um, in terms of structural stigma, there's no shortcut. There's no easy way for us to say, now this is an at-risk at group of people simply because they live in one area. So for example, we found that a lot of people in the South experienced tremendous support, not universally, but tremendous support. Um, there were a lot of networks that galvanized to help them. And then, as I said, some people in the north and metropolitan areas experienced terrible experiences. Um, so one example of this is from Brian. He's a white trans man. He's 69, living in the south. Um, and he was included in his local religious community, somewhat to his surprise. He said, it's so funny that they asked me to help with vacation Bible school. I'm also an amateur artist, and I was doing art stuff, and they wanted me to come in and teach and be part of it and everything. And I did. But yeah, I'm teaching kids, and nobody objects. In this part of the South, I've been amazed. So I think, again, this is a cautionary tale about making blanket assumptions and trying to take a shortcut to predicting people's experiences. OK. Um, I think these narratives offer a chance for us to see stigma and victimization and, and more largely trans-aging experiences um, in a more nuanced way. I think these narratives help us to see, um, I've given you just a few examples today of how people push towards um, collective resistance and self-empowerment. Um, and these narratives can be used outside trans communities. So some of these narratives have been used, um, we collaborated with a group in Massachusetts to use some of these stories in training at senior centers, not for the providers and the social workers, for the other older adults. So these narratives are helping to expand what people think trans is and to think of an older adult when they think of a trans person. Um, and so I'll conclude this section by saying I think that um, we have to think in a multi-level way and address all three forms of stigma um, at, for researchers but also helping professionals. Um, we have to resist blaming the victim. I think sometimes we focus on a group of people hurt in society and we measure their characteristics, we even predict outcomes, and then we, f we start to see those characteristics as maybe the cause of their problems. Um, and so I think thinking in a multi-level way forces us not to just focus on blaming the victim. Um, and I think thinking in a multi-level way can help us promote the um, well-being of individuals, but also to support communities who are looking to push back and change social forces around them. So I will conclude um, with a couple practice tips for the social work students in the room or the helping professionals in the room and a couple resources, um, and then we'll move on to time for some questions. Um, so first, please, if you're learning about trans issues or trans aging issues, please expose yourself um, to diverse narratives. I generally call this resisting the Caitlyn Jenner effect. Um, <laughs> I won't say any more about Caitlyn Jenner, except she's not the only trans person in the world. Um, my second piece of advice, um, especially for all of us, maybe for the young people in the room, assess and address your own ageism. Um, there are a lot of people who assume it's too late. 
to pursue a gender transition, for example. I hear a lot of people make uh, stereotypes about older people. One thing I hear is that trans older adults are so binary. Um, and in fact, that's not true. People really talk about a more fluid sense of themselves. So think through the ways that you might have ageist assumptions around these issues. Um, and for older adults in particular, this can be if you are a friend, a family member, a neighbor, or a helping professional, helping people to have difficult conversations and plan ahead. Um, trans older adults are some of the least likely to have any advanced care plans made, to have a healthcare proxy, a financial proxy, to have their wishes for end of life known, um, because, especially this generation, um, they don't have some of the same kin network that might do some of those things. So um, you can. You can go to sage.org um, and help someone you know start to think through um, how to, what their choices and preferences are as they age. Um, and I'll conclude with a few resources for you. National Resource Center on LGBT Aging, very user-friendly, um, both for professionals um, and anyone interested. And the National Center for um, Trans Equality recently put out a wonderful report on trans older adults, um, which addresses, again, kind of multi-level issues. How do you help people at the individual level? And then how do you strategize and think politically about some of the more structural level issues that impact trans people? Um, so I will conclude there, um, and we'll hopefully have a little time for questions. I'm not sure if there's a mic in the room for questions or if we just repeat it. You want to pass it up? All right. Trish has got it. Yeah. Anyone like to go first? Okay, so I know in like the black community that I'm a part of, ancestries and ancestors are so important. So just to see the documentation of ancestors is so amazing in the room. And I'm curious for that multi-generational interaction, mm -hmm. if you've shown it to younger generations who identify um, with the older generation and what the response has been and vice versa. Right. Yeah, sure, yeah. that's a great question. Um, Yes, we absolutely have shown it to younger folks. And actually, one of the you know, seeds that was planted in our minds that led to making this project is I actually had a different image um, go sort of viral, and people assumed that this was an older trans man. And interestingly, he wasn't trans, but it kind of, as things do on the internet, took its own life. And, um, and, and several people wrote these comments about how amazing it was for them to see an older trans person because they had never seen one before. And these were coming from younger trans people. And so we heard all of these comments about how younger folks felt that they didn't have a, a roadmap for what their life might look like as they age. They didn't have any visual representations. Um, and so that experience, like I said, was before we began this project, but it really planted the seed of how big the lack of representation is. And since we've made it and put it out in the world, I would say that's definitely been echoed back to us, that it's meaningful for younger people to see older adults and, and all ages and all kinds of ways of living, um, you know, not as one particular role model, but just as a, as a larger possibility model. And so we've heard from quite a few parents of trans youth that they've given their kids the book. And um, so yes, I think so. And I hope that that continues to, to happen. Oh, sure. Yeah, the question was if the book is making its way into um, public libraries and academic libraries. Yes, I believe so. Um, we've certainly pushed it as much as we can to libraries. The first edition sold out, so that was a good sign. We're in the second printing. So the book has definitely seemed to um, be acquired by institutions. And like I said, we're trying to get it both in academic libraries and just in libraries more broadly, also in places like LGBT centers, senior centers. So we're trying to get it as, as far and wide as we can. Um, in addition to the book, all of the uh, quotes and photographs are also on the website. And it's just to survive on this shore.com. So we realize the book is a lot more accessible than an exhibition, but it's still you know, a little less accessible than a website, perhaps. So we're trying to get it out as far as we can. Hi. Um, so I heard you guys said that you guys are bringing the 
um, full transcripts to LGBTQ archives. Um, I have to talk with the local trans community here in Denver. Um, and we're actually working out with the Denver Public Library to get a lot more trans archives there. And because of these are um, library archives that are not really <coughs> much into the focus, like do try to collect LGBTQ material for the focus. <laughs> Sure, yeah. I mean, so we're, so um, we have a couple of partners on board already who have agreed to take the interviews, but basically when the moment comes to actually transfer them, which the moment hasn't come because there are some journal articles that need to get published, um, when that moment comes, we're just going to prepare a digital <laughs> packet and it's basically available to anyone who wants it. So yes, absolutely. We're open to any library taking it. Um, and yeah, if you want to email us and talk specifically about that, please do. Hi. Um, thank you so much. Um, this is going great. Is <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, I, saw, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I saw your exhibit in Fort Collins about a year ago, and I had like a year to formulate this question. <laughs> uh oh. But something I've been thinking about is just like the ways that uh, the gays, uh, let me see, okay, so there's a thing that happens for those of us who are trans um, where people look at us and try to decide if we really look trans and then there's like, so there's that and there's that like, do you pass as the gender that you identify as? This is gonna come around to representation eventually. Um, then there's like, those of us who are trans, if we don't look trans, are we read as trans? And if that's a piece of our identity yeah. and people don't see us as trans, are we losing that piece of ourselves? And I'm wondering if you can talk at all about how you think, so, and, and a lot of this is about like how trans people are fetishized in the media and how images are sexualized and fetishized and tokenized and all of that. So I'm wondering like all of that stuff, like how do you think about that? Is that enough to, <laughs> Of course. I've spent like 20 years thinking about that question. Um, yeah, I mean, I th thank you for the question. That's so important. And I guess even before I talk about our project, I'll just take a step back and say, you know, I came out as, as gay when I was 13 and questioned my gender shortly thereafter. And that wasn't that long ago, 20 years. But there was no one who looked like me in mainstream media. I didn't see people who looked like me in movies and on TV. I mean, that's changed so much between then and now. Um, and the first place I discovered people who looked like me was in fine art photography books. I found Catherine Opie's work and found it really meaningful. And there was this incredibly powerful moment of seeing myself reflected. Um, and that in many ways formed the basis of my work as an artist because I believe that representation is so important. It, it can function as possibility models. Um, it can validate an identity that you're feeling or embodying. Um, and I just think it's critical that we see ourselves in the world around us. And it's sometimes for those of us who haven't seen that, when you do, you're just so blown away that, um, or at least I can speak for myself, that it's overwhelming. And so um, making representations of queer and trans and gender nonconforming people is a really important part of my practice as a whole. And with this project in particular, that was a really important part. Um, I almost always use direct eye contact because it allows the subject to really present themselves to me and the viewer. It takes away some of that voyeuristic, like I'm looking in on your life and more like you're presenting yourself to me. Um, and also, and equally importantly, it activates the viewer and it forces that person looking at this photograph to think, how am I in relationship to this person? Like, what assumptions am I making? What do I think about their gender and sexuality? And how do I feel about receiving their gaze? And so it becomes this interaction rather than this sort of passive voyeuristic experience. So in the art making, I think about those things a lot and there are formal decisions I make that um, try to amplify the dignity of the people that I'm photographing. You know, I often say I'm not in pursuit of a flattering photograph. Um, and I had a few trans women who were disappointed that I didn't have like, <laughs> you know, a crew and lights and snapping and like that's not really how, how I work. So I'm not in pursuit of like a Facebook 
profile picture, or whatever. But I am in pursuit of a dignified, respectful portrait. And that's really important to me. And so some of the formal decisions I made in the, in the image making reflect that mission. Um, and so anyway, I believe representation is really important. And I think since this has come out in the world, the response we've received has reflected that this was actually the lack that we thought it was. And so that's meaningful that it's there. Um, and then also in terms of the more relating to your question about like looking trans or passing, that was one of the reasons we saw out such a wide array of people. And I think what's happened is for people within the trans community, the images can be validating for a different variety of reasons, but people outside of the trans community, they can be incredibly educational. Because I think some people look at Sky and just would never think he's trans. And I know that's a complicated line of thinking, but for people who really need to be introduced and educated, that can be really powerful. And so we tried to create a project that, that had multiple audiences in mind, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. And I think um, another thing about the project is there are a lot of people who, some of my colleagues in the room who know about aging and older adults, um, but don't know anything about trans issues. So that offered a really nice entry point, almost like a safe way to venture in. Well, I care about older adults, and now let me kind of explore a little bit more what it means to be trans and older, um, and vice versa. So for a lot of people who are engaged in trans communities may not always be engaged and knowledgeable about nursing homes and senior centers and issues that come up as you age. So that intersection was particularly nice. We would have people entering the project from, from those two different places. Hi, my name is Meg. Um, I was going to ask a question geared more towards Jess. Um, since this project was done over the past five years, I was curious as to how you kind of released your photos or if you kind of held on to them and let them develop and write their own story. I know with like Instagram, instant gratification, <laughs> put it out there, get it out, but it seems like this is a project that's taken a lot of time and development, so just curious how you release them and how you kind of let them Sure, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's funny, when we first had this idea, I had this romantic vision of renting an RV and like taking a six month trip across the country, which I've just had that vision forever and it's never gonna happen, but, um, and that didn't happen for practical and financial reasons. But what did happen is as we made the work over time, the time actually became really integral to the work because we would photograph someone, they would, have a good experience and trust us, they would tell other people. And it really, our, our trust and access within the larger community really deepened over a period of time. So that passage of time was really important. Um, and in terms of releasing the images, you know, like I said, we did create a website early on where we had some, because I also think it's important for people who wanted to participate to see what they were participating in. I'm very big on a lot of consent on the front end. So in the earlier years, our website looked more like, um, or it was designed for potential participants. And now it looks more like an archive of what we did, but it basically had information like, here's what to do if you wanna participate, here's what to do if you wanna bring us to your town. Um, so we did release some images for sure throughout the making of the project and showed people what what they would look like. Um, but then I, would, I will say we had a pretty big release with the book and the museum exhibition and that just kind of kicked it to another level. Um, and some of that complexity for me, like with the New Yorker takeover, like came at that moment. Um, and I would say that was, you know, fall 2018. It was like really intense for a while and then it's continuing, but, um, but that was the sort of bigger release. And, um, and yeah, in terms of, you know, putting them on Instagram or things, I have some for sure, but um, because of, it was such a long-term project, that wasn't like as much of an issue, yeah. Thank you. So something that I found really compelling looking at these uh, portraits is that some of them are not just portraits, they also portray a trans relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that I really never see any other media. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So could you speak a bit about how you trust to trade those and whether or not you've done any analysis on those? I just, like, mm. I find those, like, really, really important as someone who's currently in a trans relationship. It's something that I just never see, and it's just nice seeing that other people exist. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, yeah. I mean, you know, for us, basically, whenever someone had a partner, if that partner wanted to participate, we were open to it and excited about it. So um, as we had the opportunity, we definitely included couples. And actually, we were very intentional about including in the narratives different stories about family and coupling, like Sky and Mike talk about being polyamorous. Other people talk about, you know, transitioning from what was perceived as a heterosexual relationship to what's perceived as a lesbian relationship. So people come at this from very different angles. Um, but we really wanted to show those relationships and show family and show how people build family. And so that was definitely a priority. Um, you know, some people's partners weren't as interested in being public because that was just a requirement of this project is that you have to be willing to be out. And so that was sometimes an issue. But whenever someone was interested and willing, we were really excited. I would add to that, I think sometimes there's a misconception just broadly in the world that trans is this very individual level thing, right? It, um, individual sense of identity, which of course it is, but it's also a very social experience. Your gender is connected to how who you love and who loves you and how people treat you. So um, when the opportunity was there to show people and sometimes interview um, someone and their spouse or their partner, it always enriched the story, um, and we did as much as we possibly could. In terms of analyzing um, the couples in the story, I haven't done that yet. That is a very good idea. Um, <laughs> it's too bad you're not a PhD student at my school. <laughs> we can talk. Uh, <laughs> but I haven't, I haven't thought about just pulling those interviews out. Right now, I am starting to pull just certain segments of the interviews out. So for example, um, 14 people in the project survived suicide attempts. And so I'm working with a couple students and we're pouring over those 14 interviews over and over again. And we're reconstructing the narrative of those suicide attempts um, so that we could kind of understand the antecedents and some of the consequences. So um, I could see maybe pulling out the couples in the project and looking at their dynamic and kind of trying to learn from it. So that's a good question. One more question. Hi, so my question is kind of around how y'all collected folks that would be potentially interested and coming from like the looking at representation. So um, yeah, I'm just, I'm curious about the intersection of older adults with trans experiences that are also experiencing homelessness and like how, you know, just, you know, you talk about organically people, oh, you know, I know this person, so maybe they want to come forward, but really how, you know, I'm, I'm curious, of, you know, was that a part of your intentionality? Did you see that coming up and just the population that was coming forward and the nuances of, of health and experiencing that, you know, as well, so, yeah. Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, like I said, we did seek people out in a variety of ways, so certainly when working with nonprofits, we were connected with people of a range of socioeconomic status, um, going to trans conferences. I did actually a lot of outreach on Facebook. It was particularly effective. Um, I hear that young folks aren't using it anymore, but older trans folks are. Um, <laughs> so, but, and so I guess I'll say more broadly, you know, there were certain barriers to the project, which is that a lot of the advertising was online or in the New York Times, or someone had to have resources to go to a conference or happen to cross our path. So that just exists. And then on top of that, people had to be willing to use their photo, their real name, their real city. And so there were added complexities for some folks of color, some lower income folks who couldn't afford to be out socially or financially. So there was a, there, there was a, a self-selection process for sure in who could come forward and tell their story and who heard about it and had the, the means. I will say, you know, we traveled to everyone, so that was, if, some, if someone was interested in, in, and wanted to participate, there was no kind of financial burden on their end. Um, in terms of the homelessness question specifically, I think a lot of the people we spoke with had been formerly homeless, but weren't necessarily at the time we were meeting with them. Um, or, you know, the quote Vanessa spoke about 
that particular person was housing people who were experiencing homelessness. So um, it definitely was a present part of the work. I wouldn't say we sought it out specifically, but um, we did try to cast as broad of a net as possible, and then it certainly was a part of a lot of the conversations. Great. Um, Jess and Vanessa will join us over at the book signing table for any further questions. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um,